pediatric speech language pathologist and welcome to teach me to talk the podcast i am so excited about today's show and i always say that i know i know <laughs> but it's always true and today it's really true because i'm going to teach you today tips for helping toddlers learn to point. Now, pointing is such an important way to communicate, especially for late talking toddlers when we're still waiting on their words to emerge. We refer to pointing as a gesture. Now, gesture just means a non-verbal way to communicate. And frankly, all of us use gestures. I've already used several, <laughs> even this, what, minute that we've started the show. But every one of us learns to use gestures and we continue to learn them throughout our lifetimes. Now, it is problematic for kids who are not using gestures at about 12 months, 12 to, eight, 12 to 15 months, let's say. That's when gestures first start to emerge. And actually, there's a great group, the First Words Project, uh, with uh, Dr. Amy Weatherby, who have done a project called 16 Gestures by 16 Months, which is excellent. And that really shows us how typically developing toddlers learn to use gestures and how predictive it is and how important it is. And again, all of us use gestures every single day. How many of you nod your head yes and shake your head no, even though you have those words? Or we do things like shrug our shoulders to say, oh, I don't know, or I, I, I don't care, whatever. We all use gestures every day. And again, when we don't see this happening in children, it is a big red flag that there is a developmental delay going on. Now, it could just be an expressive language delay. And certainly, children who are having difficulty acquiring words may also have difficulty acquiring gestures. But honestly, when a child is missing gestures beyond that 15 or 16 month old, we start to be concerned that it's a little bit more serious than like talking. So for us as pediatric speech language pathologists since, and other early intervention professionals, we know that we have to get those gestures going. When gestures, again, are so predictive for how a child is gesturing in that 12 to 15, 12 to 16 month period is so predictive of the language that he uses even two years later. So it's a super, super important skill for us to work on. Uh, and, and I want to walk you through this process today and let you know the steps that you can use to teach your own little friends if you're a therapist like me or your own child if you're a parent. One thing that's so important with gestures too, especially with pointing, is because it carries so much information. I call pointing the ultimate gesture, and many gestures can be difficult to teach, but again, pointing is a little more difficult because children have to master several things. First of all, they have to have that social component, meaning that they realize they're talking to you, they're trying to get your attention, and then they have to be very intentional. So uh, we call that intentionality, or making sure <coughs> excuse me, that they know exactly what they want. And they also are understanding that they have to do something to get something. And then, of course, there's the motor component. They have to be able to isolate that index finger, use their little arm, and point. And so it's pretty complex. And that's where some of us really miss the boat when we're trying to help teach a child how to point. We'll do all kinds of things like grab their little hands and, and, and you know, fold their fingers over into it and so that we can get that index finger isolated and that's important but there's some other things that we can do especially in play that will make learning how to point a lot easier for us as therapists to teach parents how to do and again if you are working in a model where you're in a school system or in an agency program where children come to you, you may not have as much interaction as the rest of us do with parents who are in homes and state early intervention programs or in uh, private practices like mine where parents are part of the program and always part of therapy. And so my job isn't always to teach the child how to do it. It's also to teach the parent how to teach the child how to do it. And so this is a super, super uh, skill for us as speech language pathologists and other early interventionists to know how we can help parents facilitate 
early gestures and especially pointing in children who were late talkers. So let's just start out with the first recommendation, which is before a toddler can learn how to point himself, he needs to see you or other people in his environment pointing all day long. So we have to really help him learn to pay attention to us, to listen to us, and then to watch us uh, and, and this is known as joint attention. And really it means just you're able to share an experience with the child. He knows that he is looking at the same thing or, or enjoying the same moment. You both are sharing that together. And, and this is a super, super important point. And again, it goes far beyond and it's more foundational than just, uh, I, again, like the uh, the example that I was showing, molding an index finger to point. It really is that, that underlying skill. He's got to know how to share that experience with you, and he's got to understand how to look when you point. So one of the things that you want to be sure that you're doing is just making sure that you are pointing all day long and that you are using gestures all day long so he gets in the habit of really watching you and really seeing what you're doing to uh, what you're going to do next and so that he is participating in that so that when you are pointing to a toy that he is following that with his little eye gaze so that he's looking too now if you've not already started doing that that's what i want you to write yourself a note <laughs> as your goal number one to be sure to do if you're a parent to really make it a point to point and if you're a therapist to really talk to parents about that that might be a parent's set of uh, recommendations, set the strategy that you want them to use for the next week or two is just to really increase the number of times that they point and that they are directing their child's attention. For therapists, you also need to be doing this in sessions and really being super intentional about pointing and super purposeful about pointing and, and talk to parents about that. Say, you know, one of the upcoming skills that we want to work on with your child is gestures. And this is important because not only do we want him to talk, but we know the thing that happens right before kids begin to talk is they use lots and lots of gestures. And so this is why we're working on this. And one of the things we have to do before we expect your child to be able to use gestures is for him to see us use gestures. And so the thing that I want you to do this week is really exaggerate those gestures that you're using. And, and again, you can talk about things like we already mentioned, nodding and shaking your head, but you need to say, I want you to point to everything you're talking about. And I'll give you some specific ideas as we move along through this course or through this show. But you've got, uh, again, as a therapist, you've got to really, really spell that out for parents. And as a therapist too, even in sessions, you may want to keep data on that, not on the kid or not even on the parents, but keep data on yourself. How many times did I point? How many times did I really use visual cues here? How many times did I use other kinds of gestures? Because I need parents to see me doing that. I need parents to understand how to model these kinds of gestures so that their child can begin to see that often enough. And you talk about it with parents as you're, we'll, we'll move along in a minute and I'll show you my best toys for working on pointing, but you'll say to parents, did you notice how many times I pointed to that? Did you see that? Or maybe that might be something that you have parents do in the session. And I do that a lot is have parents keep the data. And so you'll say, I want you to record how many times I pointed and you'll have, you'll just sort of notice with the mom, if she or dad, <laughs> if they are not noticing that, you'll say, oh, I did it again. I need another mark by pointing. So they'll really get in tune with how often you do it and that it's not just, oh, you know, once or twice that you point. You want to do it, oh gosh, a dozen or more times, even within a couple of different play activities so that you are really driving that point home to parents. Now, be very deliberate when you're pointing too. Sometimes if we have a child who's not really noticing my point, you can redirect that attention with your voice so that you are really animated and really amping it up, or as I like to say, ratcheting it up a notch so that they are paying more attention to you. But sometimes you, you need to make your finger and your arm a little more salient or to really be more noticeable. So you, you know, do things like shake your finger or if you're pointing too far away, which you're not gonna do at the beginning, but you know, if I were pointing here to Woody, I would say, you know, look, look, wow, it's Woody, look. And I'm very intentional about that or shaking my hand or doing something to capture a really distracted toddler's attention as he scans across the room. And a lot of times we'll notice when children 
haven't been habitual responders or they're not consistently looking at a point, uh, we will have to do some things to uh, attract that visual attention so that we almost distract them from looking away from you <laughs> so that they really know again there's a reason to look at you so if you're doing something like you know really shaking your finger or or moving as you're pointing they're going to notice that too all right so let's talk about some common times for pointing during daily routines and and like i just mentioned so many times when as therapists we talk to parents about this about pointing, they immediately start with something that's far away, like they'll t tell their child, look like at an airplane in the sky, or a dog that's clear on the other side of the street, or a car or something that's really, really far away. With kids who are not habitual responders, or children who don't have good uh, joint attention, who are uh, not following a point, starting far away is too hard for them. We've got to really bring that down into their own little personal visual field. So where they are really, really looking right here and then where you have more control over uh, their what they're doing and, and the, cue, the cues that you're using so that they are really paying attention to you. So what you wanna do again is bring things in to make, make it smaller and closer. So you'll do things like, you know, if I were gonna play with this woody car, with uh, a kid, we're gonna point to help them notice the car. So we would say something like, wow, it's Woody. Look, look, look. And again, when they are looking there, you wouldn't immediately start with playing with the toy, which you would naturally think you would do, but take a few minutes to point out some specific parts. And what are you doing with that? You are increasing the, the length of the attention that they are giving you, so the amount of time that they are looking at the object. So I would say something like, wow, it's Woody. See, see Woody. Oh, let's find his hat. Where's his hat? Oh, there it is. Look, his hat. His hat's right here. And oh, wow, he has eyes. Look at Woody's eyes. And to increase that joint attention, you may want to do that on yourself so that the child doesn't naturally start to exclude you because you have brought a toy out, which is a problem that happens lots and lots of times. So be sure that you're continuing to talk about that. You'll point out, you know, maybe the eyes on the car, the wheels, anything that you can do that you are really extending the amount of time that he notices that you are pointing here. And so uh, be sure that you are taking time to do that before you play with almost any toy. And for, for therapists, that's what you wanna write yourself little notes in uh, as you are uh, working with a child and moving through your session, you know, just some little notes that say point so that you're reminding yourself of that and, and talk to parents about that and you'll say, see, I'm even writing myself a note. That's a little cue to myself that I've, I've got to really increase uh, the number of times that I'm pointing so that your child sees pointing and really make it a, a, a point to point, like I said before, <laughs> before you begin a new activity. Now, as this gets easier, meaning that as the child starts to attend longer and is really looking at the object and really looking at you and staying with you longer and again don't think that this they'll stay with you for 30 minutes with you just talking about this toy you know maybe 30 seconds is even long too long for some kids that might be unrealistic but just that they are increasing the length of time so if a child barely pays attention if he stays with you for five or ten seconds that's a pretty big improvement at the beginning and so you'll need to keep sort of monitoring that and watching that and you just want to make sure that that time that you are increasing that goal realistically and not having unrealistic expectations for a kid who's been so busy and who does everything he can to get away from you you know uh, uh, again make sure that he is um, really, really moving along with that. And so once that gets better, that's when you start to increase the distance a little bit, increase your, uh, again, your visual field, meaning what the child is looking at. And so at this point, here's what I like to do, is start to use toys that I am pointing at right in front of me, and we're talking about it. And so for this toy, which is an oldie but goodie, it's one of my very favorites, it's a Hot Wheels uh, motorcycle set. It's, but I call it a launcher toy because with this kind of toy, the toy starts with you, but then it moves away. And so I think it's a fantastic way to help kid redirect a kid's attention uh, because he's going to naturally look at the toy, but you've got to do a lot of pointing with that. With that. And that, too, 
gives the child experience and opportunities and practice with uh, you pointing at something that's far away. And so that's how we do this, is we start with things that are right here that we've talked about, that we've said, look, it's motorcycles or bikes, as I, I call them, because motorcycles would be a too hard of a word for a late talker to try to say, a toddler. So I'll call them bikes. You know, look, it's a bike. See our bikes, wow. Here's a purple bike and a yellow bike. And wow, here's the launcher. Let's pull. And so you're doing lots and lots of talking about that. And as we've already mentioned, lots of pointing to uh, what you want the child to uh, do with this. Now, let me just demo. You're not going to be able to see the whole thing. But the reason we call it a launcher toy is because, like I said before, it starts with you and then moves across the room. So we would launch the toy and have it move away from us and say, look, look, where's the bike? Did you see? Look, look, there's the bike. And be very intentional and very purposeful about helping the child look for the bike and find the bike. Now, most of the time, if you're using a launcher toy, like, oh, those little stomp rockets, do you know what I'm talking about? It's a little set that uh, there's usually a button and you call them stomp rockets because the, you are supposed to stomp on the rocket and it shoots the rocket away. Now because you've got that movement, most children are naturally going to want to look and to follow the whatever the toy has moved away from you. Sometimes they don't though, especially kids who have visual challenges or attention challenges or kids who are not, uh, as we said before, is socially connected to you so they're not really caring as much about what you're doing because they, they have so much internal noise going on that they are paying attention to that or, or whatever they are doing. They are very internally driven. And so whatever, whatever it is they're doing, you, you know, they need that bigger bang for their buck. And for some kids, even exciting toys like this won't be enough. And so you are going to have to do some additional cueing to help them pay attention and see that. And so for some kids, you will have to make your space smaller so that if the launcher toy shoots too far away that they don't get lost kind of between A and B <laughs> with where it is and where it went. So do, do a lot of really directing that too. And, and if you have to really modify your environment so that you are say in a corner with a kid and you are, the kid's backed in the corner and you are out of the corner maybe with your legs out or or another piece of furniture behind you or something, that's something that is helpful too sometimes when we're really helping a child focus on pointing. And, and then we want to, again, like we're talking about with these launcher toys, extend that space just a little bit so that they are looking a little further and, and able to stay with you and stick with it a little further. So another thing that you can do that's like this, point to favorite people when you see them, especially when they are approaching you. So we talked about the toys moving away from you. Now this is an opportunity when someone is walking toward you or a launcher toy coming toward you. So maybe in a session with a therapist and a parent there, you can have the kid with the parent or with you as the therapist and then have the other adult be the person who shoots or sends the toy to the child. Or as we're talking about here with everyday routines, having a parent walk toward the child. And this is so easy for moms and dads to incorporate at the end of the day when the parent who gets home last, <laughs> that you just make this part of your routine with, you know, if I were doing it with a child, I would say something like, oh, listen, is that daddy's car? Do you hear daddy? I think I hear daddy. Oh, listen, I think I hear him walking. Listen, listen, is it daddy? Oh, look, it's daddy. It's daddy, look, look, daddy. And make a super big deal about pointing especially as daddy's walking to you. And again, you want to keep yourself in this. You don't want all the attention being focused, so you've got to still talk about daddy and do your pointing so that, uh, again, he's noticing your point and that he's, he's getting it. He's getting that input in that he's watching and listening and understanding why it is that you are trying to redirect his attention to what you want them to see. Another thing that you want to do is start to just really point to what the child wants or is about to do or say. So let's say that you are uh, sitting with a child playing at home as a parent and you know that your child is getting up to walk across the room and you think that he's going to get his ball. And so just immediately start with, oh look, I see your ball. Look, you're getting your ball. I see it, I see it. And you may even get up and go with him and accompany him to get the ball. And be sure that you're staying right in front of him so you, he can see you pointing saying, look, look, look. And again, this is different than 
what we sometimes do as therapists when we're trying to be over directive and we're saying uh, let's go get the ball find the ball and then the kid wants nothing to do with that so here you are anticipating what the child already wants to do or already wants to see and you're trying to stay one step ahead of them there and really really pointing and really doing a lot of um, directing you're not even really directing because he's already paying attention to that he's chosen that but you are layering your gesture on top of that so that he can see you point there so if you are walking in the bathroom at night <coughs> excuse me to take a bath start to walk in that room and say oh look it's time to take a bath look where's the tub look there's the tub there it is oh let's get your towel and then you're pointing to the towel and maybe pulling it off the rack and then you're saying let's find your toys where are your toys and if they're hanging you know on the back of the uh, the door in the bathroom you're really pointing as you're doing that and so make yourself intentionally point you know five or six times see how many things you can point to you can say oh we're about to turn on the water where's where's the water where do we get the water and really point at the faucet and say there's the water look look there it is you know and a lot of times just children really haven't learned what look means or watch or see and so I like to use the word look or pick one word if a family's already saying see or watch or whatever whatever word they're already using that doesn't really matter but you want to make sure that the child links a consistent directive word like look like watch like see especially in the beginning because that's his cue you know we want him really paying attention to these gestures and those are visual cues but we want him also really linking that auditory message too so really really hearing what you're saying and assigning meaning to those words so talk to parents about that as well about keeping that that verbal cue that they're using to uh, direct a child's attention uh, with that same kind of word so so think about that too that consistency there another thing that we can do that really kind of lends itself to pointing is helping a child learn how to look at pictures in a book so let me just let me just grab a couple books down here so that I can show you what I'm talking about. So at first, when you're doing a lot of looking at books and pictures, do uh, go general. So I like to use a, a simpler book with maybe one picture per page. And let me just say, guys, these recommendations are really based on generalities. You know your child best if you're a parent and you know if he already likes to look at lots of books but you may also notice that when you do use books that are busier like the next one that I'm going to show you sometimes the kid can kind of get lost in there and there's so much to look at that you can just see his little brain and his little face his little eyes just scan 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 he's not really attending to much of anything because he's just sort of taking it all in so sometimes going simpler is better but again that's so dependent on a child so what you might want to do is just when you're looking at at books here and you want to you've got to use pointing and so you want him to see you point and so give him some little um, verbal cues here too or auditory cues something he can hear so tapping your finger on a book is a really nice way to get him to start uh, to really look at your pointing and really notice that you're pointing and look at the specific picture that you're pointing at so you would you know uh, to talk about this baby you know of course you're gonna say baby look at this baby did you see see that baby oh that's my baby's eyes see look baby's eyes baby's eyes and so you'll do that for a while but if you think the child is ready go ahead and say you show me baby's eyes you show me and the fingernail trick the tapping is really good lots of kids will like that and of course they're gonna may get interested in your fingernails and get a little distracted and sometimes I'll work with families that uh, moms, you know, they're at a different stage of life than me. And when I was in my 20s and 30s and had little kids, I didn't have long uh, manicured fingernails either. <laughs> so I didn't have that little uh, advantage there with tapping. But sometimes kids will get real kind of hyper-focused on that and you'll have to redirect that. But talk to moms about how they can really use that tapping and use that that little um, auditory cue and that works super well for some kids some kids you know I just introduce it like that and within a session or two they're pointing they're trying to tap their little finger and that's made the difference for them and so great great trick if you've never used that before too now remember when you're doing a more complex book pointing is even more important because if you're showing a kid a book like this with so many pictures and you're saying where's the flower you know he's got lots and lots of things to look at 
really using that cue there is a super way to redirect a child's attention and get him to uh, focus on the picture that you want him to see. And if that's a real problem for kids, just go with the strategy that we talked about before. If you feel like he's looking at the big truck, don't try to distract him over here. Go with what you know, because your point is what? That he follows your point, that he's paying attention to what you're doing. And so sometimes we too as adults, we, we are a little bit too directive or too directed where we are demanding that children shift their attention and shift their focus when we should follow their lead. And when we should, uh, if, uh, again, if you notice that they're pointing over here, don't try to get them to look over here. Uh, go with something that they are naturally trying to look at already on their own. So books are a super, super tool for this too. You can use though that cue that we talked about with uh, tapping and you can certainly even do this with another kind of toy. So great, great way to get that little cue there. Another thing that you want to do once you've really gotten this established in that smaller visual field that we talked about and then you make it a little bigger, this is the point then when, when a kid is really, you notice, gosh, every time I point right here, he's really looking at me now. We've got some nice joint attention start, starting to develop here. That's when you move out a little bit. And so you might create some interesting things for a child to look at. So if he likes a particular toy, like if he's really into Thomas the Train, you might put Thomas in unexpected places in your house and then when you walk in that room with him, say something like, see, look, there's Thomas. Where is he? Look, look, look. And you're finding him. And you can set up some really cool kind of hide and seek or I spy kind of games, even with the toddler when you start with that sort of thing. And so, or if you're not taking their very favorite objects here, you can do this with anything. You might just create some high interest things uh, like a helium balloon that you uh, let go to the ceiling and he's not noticed that before or even one that he's noticed if he loves it. You know, you might talk about where is that balloon? Where did that balloon go? Oh, look, I see it's up. The balloon's up there. Look, look, look. So that you're really directing his attention to that too. So great way to do it. If a child, if you lose a child at that point, you might want to bring it back down here and again, get them really interested in looking for that object, even when it's right here. And this really looks like uh, those games that we play for object permanence, where we're having children begin to look for an object. So we're, you know, we're going to show them, oh, listen, listen, here's the ball. Can you hear that? And then you're hiding it under the blanket and doing your big, where'd it go? Where's the ball? Let's find the ball. Oh, look, look, I think it's here. And again, you're giving them that practice in the smaller visual field before you start to place that item a little further away. So if the kid has a harder time with this, if you've gone, if you jumped ahead too far and you're having him try to look for objects that you've hidden out of sight and he's not doing that, back it up this is the point that we uh you know we always say on the show meet a child where he is and so if he can't do it out there you know anytime a kid is having difficulty reaching a goal it's it's why it's because the goal is too hard so you have to back up and you have to make that a little bit easier and so for for kids that you've jumped ahead again to this level and they can't do it you know you've got to practice a little more here um, in, a, in that smaller space and you could even do things like putting their sippy cup if you are playing with them if we were here in this space and we were on the floor playing I might put their cup just up here on the table and then say you know where's your cup let's find your cup oh look there it is and then I'm just pointing up and it just gets a child in that um, habit or in that in that just uh, experience with looking up and looking around for that sort of thing. All right, so what if you're doing all this pointing and you are still getting nowhere? What should you do? Well, we've already talked about this, but I wanna be sure that you, again, know how to troubleshoot and know how to problem solve. So you've gotta always think, again, like we talked about, that if the goal is too hard, we've gotta back up and then we always have to look at the cues or the help that we are providing. And so the tagline I use for, if you've been watching or listening to this show, even if you're pretty new and this is your third or fourth show, you've probably already heard me say this before, but it's tell him, show him, help him. So these mean verbal cues, tell him, visual cues, show him, and then tactile cues are helping him. So what are some visual cues that you can do to help a child, uh, or I'm sorry, verbal cues that you can do to help a child learn to watch your point. We've already talked about that. You make yourself 
uh, more exciting to listen to so you and you pick a consistent word like look or watch or see and as the kid starts to get really good at that then you can mix it up a little bit you can change the cue a little bit and make sure that they understand uh, more complex language so that was your verbal part of that your uh, also, let's think about your other auditory cues that we talked about. That was the tapping. So again, if you are trying to get him to notice the truck that he just, let's just say he loves Little Blue Truck. You've got him a toy like that. Or he loves one of your Paw Patrol, Paw Patrol toys and, you, and he can't really find it. You know, bring that object uh, down and then do some, some of the tapping that we talked about with our uh, auditory cues there. Another thing we can do as I'm skipping ahead is show him. So visually, bring that object closer to you. If we were talking about the Woody car that we used before and I couldn't get a kid to look at it down here or look at it across the room, you know, I'm gonna bring it in really, really close and really, really close to me and to him. So right here where I've just, I've, I've made it just virtually impossible for him not to look at that. So that's certainly a visual cue like uh, with that as well. And then uh, tactile cues. One of the best things that you can do when a child is not looking at where you want him to look is direct his little hands to hold or touch what it is that you want him to look at. Now, for some of us as parents, we're really into that don't touch it, just look, don't touch it. But a toddler's eyes always follow his or her little hands. And so if you're having difficulty with that, just let him hold it while you are pointing and you are directing his attention to various things and, you know, as well doing your auditory cues. All right, so that was our first step in helping a child learn how to point, is we are going to point so that he can see the pointing, he can notice what we're doing and assign meaning to that, which means, aha, I should pay attention. I should direct my little eyes to whatever it is that mommy or my therapist or grandma or daddy or whoever is, is wanting me to look at. So following that uh, visual point is step number one. Step number two is an extension of this, which is related to what I just talked about with tactile cues and that's uh, holding or, sh and this happens when children learn how to show and give. Now, a lot of times as therapists, we don't think about showing and giving being gestures, but they are, and they always come first before pointing. So if we have a child who, again, is having difficulty even really directing his attention like we've been talking about, we back up to this point where we're doing a lot of, and I call these show, hold, and give routines. And we talk about this in my uh, therapy manual, Let's Talk About Talking. Now, that is such a fantastic book for children who are minimally verbal or not yet verbal and who are just having a hard time and you are racking your brain trying to figure out what's wrong, what skills are missing, get that book. It's not available all year long. We only, because it's so big and we have, uh, there are, it's 337 pages and it's incredibly difficult to produce. We have, um, you can get that book and it will walk you through some of this, these things to let you know, but show, hold and give is one of the routines that I really, really talk about in that book. And so let me just describe what this is. So you're always gonna show a child what you're about to do that's necessary for the next step. And again, here, we're working on him paying attention to what you're pointing to, but we're, we're doing that in between step, which is so that he's going to start to show us things and give us things. So we set up these little routines. So we're gonna show a child what we're doing next to talk about it. We're gonna hold the item as we prepare to use it. We're gonna give him the item so that he can hold it and then eventually we want him to give that back to us so that we are all paying attention to the same thing. So show, hold, and give. So let's talk about this example in a diaper routine. So this would be saying something like, you are so wet. It's time to change your diaper. Let's go get your diaper. Look, where are the diapers? Look, they're over there. Let's go get a diaper. And so you walk to get a diaper. And then once you have it, <laughs> you hold it up and say, see, it's the diaper. Look, a diaper. And then you can hold it or you can go ahead and give it to your child and then get to wherever you are, are doing your diaper changing. As he's holding it and you're telling him you hold the diaper, and then you were talking about it as he's holding it, as you were getting ready to change the dirty diaper for the clean diaper. You're still talking about that clean diaper. You're still pointing. And then you say, oh, now we're ready. You give me the diaper. And you were holding out your hands. This is the giving part. 
so that he can give that diaper back to you. If he doesn't do it, have one of your hands outstretched, take your other hand and help him place the diaper in your hand, take it away and say, thank you. You gave me the diaper. And again, you, this is a great way that starts early turn taking and joint attention where you are both paying attention to the same thing. And remember, we wanna get him in the habit of showing and giving because that gesture precedes pointing. And if he can't do a lot of showing and giving, there's no way that he's developmentally ready to point. So we have to start uh, working on that as kind of your, your before step or your in-between step if, if you haven't been able to get a child to point. So beyond the, we talked about at the beginning, we're gonna point a lot so that we can get that child to uh, see us and pay attention to us as we point. We're gonna be sure that we're giving him lots and lots of cues and this is the next step is the showing and giving routines there, show, hold, and give. An additional way to work on this is any time that your child is holding an object. And let's just say that he's here with us and he's looking at this book. Don't try to take it away from him, but do a lot of like we were talking about before, admiring and talking about what he's already paying attention to. And really so that he, he understands that you are show, he is showing you this item. So a lot of times I'll, do, I'll just really lean close to the book and then doing a lot of getting my face on the same level as the child and whatever it is that he's looking at so that he understands he starts to get oh I want her to look at this and it's so funny to me when a kid sort of gets it and has that ah oh, moment where you know kids will start just putting putting things right up on my face <laughs> you know and we don't want them to stammer or anything like that but I, I, I or you know I'm thinking I, I don't want them to think that that's how we naturally do it but I do think, wow, he gets it. I was really looking at that. He's, he wants me to see it. He's got it right here in my face too. So do some of those things, not forever, not for months and months so that a child gets really stuck on that uh, unnatural way to give someone an item or show someone an item, but enough so that he understand, you understand that he understands that you are really showing him something and that he is really showing you something and that you are really, really looking at that and so just admire the object and talk about it don't necessarily talk think about taking it away all the time so that he's the giving part you might have to just do a lot of really talking about what he's already paying attention to so again that he likes showing you things he wants you to look at it and just your voice and your face can go a long way with that with you know saying something like oh I see I see that baby look look at that baby and so you're talking to a child in that animated, you don't have to be loud, but in that really um, child directed, that mother ease or parent ease tone of voice where you're very melodic and you're using your voice again and you are really looking at the object and looking back at the child and looking at the object and looking back at the child. And I, you know, I keep talking about joint attention here, but that's what you're really establishing uh, when you're helping a child learn how to point and learn uh, why pointing is useful for all of us. All right, so that was the second step in pointing to really help the child learn how to share attention with you, to help him learn how to show you things and give you things so that he, he is getting that he wants your attention and that he can use an action or a gesture or a body movement to get your attention. All right, so that, that was the second step. The third step here, the next step in helping a child learn how to point is imitating other easier motor actions. You know, we've already talked about how pointing can be difficult to teach a child because it is fairly difficult to round the rest of their fingers and isolate their index finger. And so when a kid can't do that, you do think, again, like we've already talked about, I've got to back up, I've got to make this easier. So you're going to start with easier motor actions that he imitates or he copies when he sees you do, like banging on a table. And how do, how do we set that up? We just wait until he is at a table or with us, or even you could even do this on the floor. And so when he's not really doing much of anything else, just say, bang, 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 bang. bang and see if you can get him to copy that back. And a lot of times kids who aren't 
uh, immediate imitators are going to have to watch you do that for a little while, especially if you've never done anything like that before as a parent or as a therapist. They're just not used to an adult doing that with them. And so use your voice like I talked about. Use your face like I talked about or showed you there. And then you may even have to help him, that tell him, show him, help him piece where you were taking his little hands and banging it on the floor or banging it on the table too so that he gets, hey, she wants me to copy her. She wants me to do what, I, what she's doing here. So banging on the table, things like raising your hands and shaking your hands. And you can do this, you know, just in the context of saying, yay, or something like that. You know, clapping is the next great, easy, early motor skill to try to get that uh, imitation going here. So clapping is you cheer for them. So you wait until they do something like, you know, put a ball in the hole with a toy, yay. Or they eat a bite of cookie, yay! Or they, oh, whatever, put the puzzle piece in the puzzle. Turn the page of the book, yay! You're cheering there. So lots of children, the more animated you are, the easy and the more consistent you are with clapping like that, the more they are going to want to imitate that too. Even clapping for a little game like patty cake, where you are really modeling that, you know, patty cake, patty cake, baker's man. Bake me a cake as fast as you can. Pat it up, roll it up, and throw it in the pan. And again, if you were watching this, if this is the, the first little time you've ever watched me, you're thinking this lady has lost her mind. I model these kinds of things during the podcast so you can hear it. And if you're watching on YouTube, so that you can see it, because that's the level of engagement and that heightened affect. Uh, that you need a lot of times to get a kid to really start to imitate and really start to, uh, for some kids, attend. So that's a super, super way to get a kid interested in playing a, a social game with you. And again, the reason that you would want to play it in this context or what we're talking about today is helping them learn how to imitate a gesture so that they can start to imitate more complex gestures, which would be pointing. So here we're beginning with easier, earlier motor actions. And we talked about banging your hands on the table, waving your arms. It might be something like kicking or jumping, where you're even going for something more gross motor. We always have to start with bigger body movements first and then move in and make it more refined. So for some kids, like marching, or, or like I already mentioned, jumping or running with you across the room. When we can get them to do that with you or in, in imitation of you, that's how you start to teach a point. And, and for therapists, you've got to get good at explaining that to parents so that they understand. You know, and if a parent says he never points, I want him to point. You know, you've got to back him up that we've already talked about and say, you know, before he points, he's got to be able to imitate and, and complete spontaneously, independently on his own, do some of these easier, earlier gestures. Now, he's not going to do those automatically until he can imitate those. And so we've got to teach him. So we've got to get him to copy. And so you walk that back when a parent gives you a goal like that. You walk it back. You think, well, okay, he's not pointing, but is he imitating some of these earlier gestures he's not doing there but that okay great is he you know can he imitate anything and so you walk it all the way back to the point where you you find your starting point and that's how you explain that to parents and get them on board with that another thing that's along this continuum here with imitating easier earlier gestures or motor actions like that would be to bump it up just a little bit where maybe they're doing hand motions in songs. So something with their hands like open, shut them. Do you know that little song? I'm gonna sing it for you in case you don't know it uh, because this is where I get the most emails from parents where they'll say, you mentioned a song, but I've never heard that song before. Or uh, you referenced that like everybody knows that. W what is that? And so let me just go ahead and sing it for you in case you don't know it. And again, it might seem a little strange to you, but I'm going to do it just like I would if I were working with a child and a parent. Again, so that you can see the level of animation and excitement that you need to have to really hook that child's attention so that he wants to try to imitate you and that he wants to try to learn how to do these hand motions on his own. So open, shut them. Here, here we go. Open, shut them, open, shut them, give a little clap. Open, shut them, open, shut them, put them in your lap. Creep them, creep them, creep them, creep them, right up to your chin. Open wide your little mouth, ah, do not let them in. 
Mm, and you do that with the child, you know, uh, creep them, creep them, creep them, creep them right up to your chin and, you know, creep toward the kid and you might do it some on you and some on him. And you, what are you doing here? You want him to begin to try to open and close his little hands. And again, why are we doing this? So that he could imitate gestures so he is on his way to beginning to uh, be able to point when he wants to direct your attention. But this is how we get there. Other songs like Wheels on the Bus, I'm not gonna sing that one for you. Uh, but any little hand motion song where you get him in the habit of using his hands. Itsy Bitsy Spider is a great one for this where uh, again, your only point, who cares if he can't really do it? If he's just trying to do something with his hands, yes, you have succeeded. <laughs> you are on your way there uh, to getting him to, uh, teaching him how to use some early gestures. Now, let's move a little closer to pointing. After we've made sure, let's review our steps here. First, what do we want you to do? We want you to point so that the child can hear you a lot or see you a lot, understand what pointing means. Secondly, we want you to give those cues. So tell her, show her, help her, uh, watch you as you're learning how to point. And then what were we doing? We're doing showing and giving because those are the gestures that are easiest and that are, are you know, reaching, showing and giving. We want to get that, uh, that intentionality going and that back and forth turn taking and joint attention piece. That's what we were doing with showing and giving. And then we were going to bump it up just a little bit with our third step, which was what? Using those easier, earlier actions or hand motions that we're going to have a child imitate. So now, if a kid can do all that, they're really, really ready. So we want to get them to start to use a point. So now we're at the point where we can really talk about what are some toys that facilitate this isolation of the index finger. And again, if you're a parent, you might think, well, that is a roundabout way of saying pointing, but that is what you're really doing is helping them learn how to get that little finger going. So the number one thing that you can do are some of the things that we've already talked about. Uh, with our books that we mentioned before, that tapping, let me show you a couple of books that I like to use for this purpose that are a little bit more specific with helping the child learn how to point. Uh, and one is uh, just a book that would have some, not quite to pointing yet, but have some sliding that they can do. So there's more of an action uh, here. And again, some kids are going to want to do that with their whole hands first, and I get that. But do everything you can to see if he can just do it with one finger. And I mean, you know, some kids aren't going to be able to do that, but it's certainly uh, a way that you can try that. This is a fantastic version of Brown Bear because it has the next... Uh, picture here and kids like that kind of that surprise portion of that so that's a great book brown bear brown bear I think I got this one at Target but it was several years ago I'll try to post the Amazon links to some of these toys too other books that work really well for this are this Cheerio series where you I hope you can see this uh, there are pre <laughs> pre-done Cheerios here as a picture, but then there are spaces or little holes where we put the Cheerios right here. Now, some of you are thinking, well, the kid is no way. Are you ever gonna get a point right there because he's going to eat the Cheerios? And yes, you're absolutely correct. He is going to eat the Cheerios, but he has to get a pincer grasp going which is also a prerequisite to pointing. And what is a pincer grasp? It's just, some parents call it pinch or grasp, but I understand why they use that word for it because it is like you have a little pinch going there with your thumb and your index finger. And so just, you know, helping them put the Cheerios down, or usually I start with already putting the Cheerios down and then having them reach down and get those Cheerios. And again, if we're walking a child through this process, if you have kids who really can't isolate their index fingers, you've got to back up and make sure that they have that good pincer grasp. And so there, I have a couple of Cheerios books that I really like uh, for this activity. And so you can look there. And again, I'm going to try to get these links posted as well. So those are great. This is a super book that's sort of best of both worlds. Um, it had the sliding feature like um, Brown Bear, Brown Bear, but it's with a circle. And so they really have to get their little fingers in there. As you can see, it's not as easy as you might always want it to be, but kids have to have a little bit of effort, and I like that too. And so I like this book as well because it's got great pictures. You can certainly 
get tons of language practice. And let me just say, we didn't mention this before, but bef so many times with books, with parents, they're focused on, you know, what's that? What's that? Say snake. When really we should be doing it receptively with asking, you know, where's the snake? Or where's the dog? Uh, long before we expect a child to be able to say it because kids have to understand words before they use those words to communicate. So I like this book because I can show a kid how to, how to use an, uh, his pointer here and slide these pictures all around because there's so many to do on one page. And it's not like I'm taking the, pa the, the whole toy. You know, it's not my turn, your turn. We're doing it together. And so I like this book as well for this purpose. So be sure that you're also using that cue that we talked about with tapping your finger. And you'll say things like, oh, get your finger right there, right in the hole. See? See, look. Put your finger in the hole and help a kid um, move it over that way. So great, great toy for facilitating pointing. Other things that you can do, maybe if that's too hard, look at some of our other more popular music toys for babies. And so like this little piano, but you really want them not to bang and do the whole thing, which kids will naturally want to do. But help them want to get one at a time and really model that very careful, oh, cookie monster, <laughs> that very careful pointing here where just one finger on one key. Um, you can certainly do it with other little toys too. I like this one because I don't have to have the music on, uh, but can still push the keys. And this one takes a little bit of strength too. Our OT friends would probably say um, that that's an important goal, you know, that they have some finger strengthening or whatever. I want them to point. So if I'm seeing that they are getting that little ball to pop up there, I know that they're uh, on their way to be able to do that. You may also want to try something like a little pop and pals toy, but guys, it's going to be hard for a kid to want to isolate his index finger because these are going to work a little bit better with a whole hand. So you'll have to do some talking here and say, oh, just one finger, you know, one, 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 get one finger on that toy. And so uh, help a kid with that and don't just automatically assume that because you use a toy that's recommended in the video that it will naturally work. Uh, I do like this one because there is, can you see this dial? There is one spot where you have to get your finger in there just right and I am not even able to do it so that a uh, kid is going to be able to activate the toy. And again, it's not work on video today. Okay, let me show you some other toys that we can um, do with this kind of thing. This is one of my favorite ways to really get um, an isolated index finger. Get some toys that have some holes in them. And so this is a cool toy that I just bought off Amazon. And it's not even really for putting your fingers in the holes, but you'll see the cool holes here. The purpose of the toy here is it's a magnet toy. And so the mama bird is getting the uh, worm so that she can feed it to the baby bird, which again is a whole fine motor control issue in and of itself. But do you see what you could do with pointing? It's really helping a kid stick one of his little index fingers in the holes here. And, and you'll know when you're playing with this and you'll tell a parent, look, the purpose of the toy, like I just explained, really is this, but what I want to see your child do is get his fingers in there. And so you can make this as fun and playful as possible. So sticking it in and saying, oh, do you feel that in there? Let's tickle, 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 or whatever you want to say to entice a child to put his fingers in that hole. So great um, toy for that purpose. I have another new toy that's very similar that I also just uh, purchased from Amazon. It's a little hedgehog. And the premise of this toy would be to put the pegs in the holes. But while you're doing that, and, and I, I do like it because with the, we talked about the pincer grasp and what a prerequisite skill is or the step it is on the way to pointing. But you can certainly have a kid just stick their little fingers right there in the hole. So two super toys uh, for that kind of purpose. Another thing, um, that I like to do here at this level is have a child pop bubbles just with using his little index fingers as well. And so most kids will try to pop the bubble 
with their whole hands, but say, today we're gonna do it with just your finger. Show me your finger. We're just gonna pop with your little bitty finger right there. And then do lots of focus modeling where you are just popping the bubble with your index finger as well. Another thing that I like to do is modify a toy so that a child is um, really seeing that I wanted just to use one finger. So when I was looking through my toy closet, my new toy closet in our awesome clinic that we're just uh, getting established here, but take a toy and then think, what can I do to make this toy more likely that he'll just isolate his little index finger? So look what I did. I went over to Dollar Tree and purchased these little, I call them uh, garage sale dots. I don't know what you call them, but, and then just put it on the toy so that they have more of a target here. And you can say, just like we talked about with the bubbles, today we're just gonna do it with one finger. I want you to put your finger right here on the dot, see? And so you are showing them uh, where you want them to do it and how you want them to do it. And again, will a kid decide that he's gonna do it with his whole hand? Probably because they're toddlers, but you have modified it and you've made it a little more likely that he'll isolate his index finger there just by using something like those little dots. So that's another super way uh, to get that going. One of my favorite tricks, another trick here is, and this is from an OT friend of mine who uh, was doing this with a child one day and I thought this is fantastic, but she use play-doh and one of the things you want to do is make a pretty big mound of play-doh i probably needed a bigger can of this for this demonstration but make a pretty big mound and then have them push a toy down into the play-doh and we talked about finger strengthening when we were looking at that little leapfrog piano toy but you can really do this with anything now sometimes therapists will want to use something like a cookie cutter but I promise the bigger the material that you use, the more likely it is that the child is going to want to use his whole hand. So if you pick some tiny little objects, they're more likely to use it just with their index finger. So really set it up like that where you're saying, just use your finger, watch, watch, do it like me. And then help them just get one little finger on there and really push it down into the Play-Doh. Kids think that's funny, they'll wanna take it out. And again, they're using their pincer grasp to get uh, the toys out, but you can roll it up and then repeat it. Uh, a lot of kids will do this for a long time, and that is fantastic because you're giving them repeated opportunities for practice. Okay, next little trick that I wanna show you to uh, get a kid to point is to use your own finger here. And I love this one. You're drawing maybe a dot on your own finger, and you are showing them, look what's on my finger. See, it's a dot. Let's make a dot on your finger too. And then you draw a dot on their finger. Uh, you, some kids you might end up doing a smiley face or whatever, but I really like a dot. And I say things like, let's touch our dots. Let's put our dots here. And then we'll get a picture, a book, and we'll put our dots on the book. And so you can certainly uh, entice a kid. And if, if it's a kid that's not really into toys, a kid whose attention is, is just all over the place, sometimes doing something like putting a a dot with a pen on their finger is just the thing that you need to get them to do to really, really uh, focus on that and get those little index fingers going. Um, the last, uh, one of the last strategies that I'm going to share with you too is to use songs that emphasize your index finger. And I have a couple of good ones for you. I uh, remember the song, Where's Thumpkin, Where's Thumpkin? Well, be sure that you're just really, st I start this song when I'm working with kids on uh, pointing here with just, and we just sing about their pointers. You know, where is pointer, where is pointer? Here I am, here I am. How are you today, sir? Very well, I thank you. Run and hide, run and hide. If that's too many words, go with, or in addition to that, go with a little blackbird song. Do you know that song? Um, and, and here's how you do this song. Uh, two little blackbirds sitting on a hill, one named Jack and one named Jill. And then you just sing the rest of that song, and my goodness, the words have just escaped me there. <laughs> I haven't sung it in a long time. Two little blackbirds sitting on a hill, one named Jack and one named Jill. He, uh, fly away, Jack. Fly away, Jill. Come back, Jack. 
Come back, Jill. All right, there may be another verse in there, another line that I've forgotten, but that's the premise. And the point is, who cares? You are trying to get them to use their little index fingers and kids love that. And especially when you use that song or these little songs, as you're incorporating all these activities, can you see that you could have taken books and baubles and the racetrack and the little piano toys and the Play-Doh and the hedgehog toy? You know, you've gotten six or seven toys. Uh, the, uh, any other toy like the racetrack that you could have modeled, a game like Lucky Ducks where you put the Lucky Ducks game down on the floor between you and you're just really encouraging a child just to isolate his index finger to get that button. And then in between those toys, those seven or eight toys that we've talked about, get your little songs going and then you've spent a whole session with a kid working on other goals too, but really, really isolating those index fingers so that he can point. So great way to do it and, and, and make it all fit into one session and then a great way to explain it to parents because you can't just practice with one or two little ideas. You've really got to help a child generalize, which means that he's able to use that skill all the time. All right, once a kid can do that, once he's really, really, really isolating his little index finger and again i think this is step number four here with that we're here at our last step here for teaching pointing and that's so that he can use it functionally so what do you do that means he's got to use this point to get something so i like to use this with two adults and usually it's mom and me in therapy or i talk to mom about how to do it and she does it with dad at home or with an older sibling and you just have one person be the helper with the child and another person be the giver and so you're going to do something like if they love cheerios you would just shamelessly eat cheerios in front of them <laughs> and say you know oh these cheerios are so good mm -mm -mm, they're so good are you going to show me what you want do you want a cheerio too show me and then you really help them point and so you could do it with a choice. You could set it up with a food that they like and a food that they don't like. And that, that non-preferred choice is really valuable, not only when you teach pecs, which is you know, how I really learned about using that non-preferred choice, but even with something like pointing, where you give them something you know that they don't want and something they do want, and they cannot get what they do want until they point. And so as soon as they point, even, even if the helper person has to help them point, oh, go crazy with with rewarding them with oh yes here's a cheerio oh it's so good here mm -mm 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 -mm. let him eat the cheerio or take a drink of the milkshake or whatever it is that you're using that's just so motivating for them and then start over and give them lots and lots of opportunities to point if they uh, are kids that like to carry around their sippy cup all the time Put the sippy cup up where they can't really reach it, where they are really have to point and where they're really requiring that you assist them and that you provide them help. We talked about that a few minutes ago with their favorite toys, putting their toys up on higher shelves. And so you can certainly do that where they have to um, point to get what they want. And then this last idea is so fun and it was in Let's Talk About Talking. And this family, such a fun family, came up with it. Oh gosh, I worked with this family probably 15 years ago, but they called it Dance Puppet, and they called it that because they said anything that they got their toddler to do, who was uh, developmentally delayed, anything that they would just, they would just go crazy, and they would just do anything their child wanted them to do just to get a reaction. So they really started this with pointing. So whenever the child would point at mom or dad or whoever, they would just do the silliest thing they could think of. You know, they would they would just make it like a raspberry sound. <laughs> they would fall down on the ground. They would, you know, do some kind of crazy movement but again we use that with pointing so whenever the child learned to point whenever he would point like that you know and, the, and they called it dance puppet they came up with this game on their own and I thought it was just brilliant but I've done it in sessions with kids and it's super super fun and it is very very motivating especially when a child is very social and when he adores his or her parents and then you know what are you teaching him when you're doing these more functional things at the end you're teaching him the power of pointing and that he can really use that gesture communicatively to change his little world, to get what he wants. And so I hope that these ideas have given you some new ways to work on what might be a really challenging skill, and especially because there's a motor component. And lots of times we as SLPs get a little bit tripped up with that. So um, 
this was these are my ideas for this if you want to get continuing education credits you can always do that for five dollars for every uh, podcast episode at teachmetotalk.com and look in the post below for those instructions uh, that's it for today thank you so much for joining me i'm laura mize pediatric speech language pathologist and you have just participated in teachmetotalk.com's podcast Thank <laughs> you.